Hello and welcome to Oak Grove Media and Film. Today we're tackling conventions, specifically newspaper conventions, what they are and how they change over time. There's quite a few things we're going to cover, so buckle in and let's get ready. A convention is a way in which things are usually done. It's a general agreement about basic principles or procedures. For example, if you study Shakespeare's play Macbeth, you will understand that Lady Macbeth was not a conventional woman due to her murderous and vicious nature. A conventional, therefore stereotypical Jacobean woman would be calm, loving and maternal. Everything Lady Macbeth was not. Conventions are also used in films. In a horror film, a convention is low-key lighting. We expect to see low-key lighting. We expect to experience low-key lighting when watching a horror film. This increases the suspense and tension and to add to the fear of the unknown. It would be very unconventional for a horror film to be shot in high-key lighting. The fear of the unknown would just not be the same. In pop music videos, performance oriented to the camera is conventional along with cuts to the beat. In magazines, having a distinctive mask head at the top is conventional as is having a cover model. Conventions are simply the way in which things are usually done. It is what us, the audience and consumer, expect from a specific media form and or genre. Now, we've discussed films, music videos and magazines. All of these are different genres of media products. It's important to understand that different genres have different conventions. Some are even hybridised. This is the same for newspapers. Newspaper is a genre. Have a look at all these front pages. What similarities or conventions can you see? They all have a masthead, a splash, a headline. They do have some differences, however, in the amount of text they have, the amount of subheadings they have, the stand first, the off lead, and so forth. This is due to the secondary genre of the newspaper, whether it's a tabloid or a broadsheet. Let's dive into these more specifically. Let's have a look at tabloid first. Have a look at these variety of tabloids. What similarities can you see? What conventions are you seeing? You may have noticed how a lot of them have red tops, red mask heads, they are known as red tops. Or perhaps you notice how the front pages are largely dominated by images and have little copy, little text. Perhaps you notice how the headlines are often wordplay or sensationalist in nature. UK newspapers can generally be split into two distinct categories. The more serious and sexual newspapers, you refer to broadsheets and sometimes known collectively as a quality press and others generally known as tabloids, the collective known as popular press. These popular press papers tend to have more of a focus on celebrity coverage, human interest stories, rather than political reporting or overseas international news. The tabloids in this, in this turn have been divided into more sensationalist mass market, red tops, such as what we saw here, and more middle market papers, what we see here, the Daily Mail and the Daily Express. The Daily Express and the Daily Mail are sort of an in-between, a broadsheet and a tabloid. They do, some, they do often um, discuss hard news, such as political affairs, however they do it in a more sensationalist, tabloid-esque way. While the word tabloid has a really fascinating origin, Burroughs and Wacom Co. created a label to a new form of medicine that was marketed as tabloid pills, and this was in the late 1880s. Before the, the development of these tabloid pills, medicine was sold in really large, bulkier powder forms. As these new medicines became uh, marketed as smaller tabloid compact formats, the term tabloid became popular and became use, came into common use in popular culture, meaning something small or something um, that's easily absorbed therefore led to tabloid journalism, condensed stories in a simplified, easily absorbed format. The first ever tabloid paper was the Daily Mirror, published in 1903 by Alfred Charles William Harmson, the first Viscount of Northcliffe, then also the, da the owner of Daily Mi uh, Mail, which might be shocking considering the complete polar opposites of the Daily Mail and the Daily Mirror today. In its maiden issue, published on 2nd November 1903, Harmsworth have explained that the name was a reflection of a mirror of feminine life, and that its content should be entertaining without being frivolous, and should be serious without being dull. Which is exactly what tabloids still are today. As opposed to straight news reporting, the mirror built its foundations on crime stories, gossip, pu puzzles, sports, and within a year had become known as a pictorial newspaper, featuring far more photographs and images than its competitors. This gave it a broad appeal. 
Within five years, it was Britain's second largest morning newspaper and paved the way for other tabloid exam- other tabloids such as The Sun and even The Daily Express. Since their inception, tabloids have been renowned for their variety. This is a symptom of their intention to maintain the broadest appeal possible. So they want to target the large majority of people. They want to target the mainstream audience. Where broadsheets tend to focus on news and news alone, tabloids trade in the currency of entertainment with something for everyone approach. Historically, aimed at a working class market, they interperse and, and they, they provide an often sensationalised version of the hard news we, we go through today or we experience today. Sometimes also deal in astrology and gossip columns and agony arts and comic strips as well. So you could argue that the convention of a tabloid did not change massively over time. As we see with the front pages on the left and the front pages of the right, a lot of them are still sensationalised in their headlines, a lot of them are still image dominant and so forth. However, you could say with the image, the front covers today are a lot more image um, image centered as opposed to the front pages of um, the 50s, 60s and so forth. What are the conventions of a tabloid? These are the ones I would give you. All of these are very common amongst tabloids. Now, for special occasions or for really big events or for perhaps a an anniversary celebrating the, the release of the newspaper, then these tabloids, these conventions may change. However, these are the conventions of a tabloid. The conventions within tabloids, online tabloid papers as well, is that they often are still heavily image dominated. They often are moving images, a lot more videos and comment sections as well. Broadsheets, however, are vastly different to tabloids. These broadsheets date back all the way to the 18th century, so the 1700s. Although it, the reasons aren't abundantly clear, it seems that the British government in 1712 placed a tax on newspapers relating to the number of pages. Therefore, to counter this and to save money, publishers made their products much larger in order to decrease the page count and therefore decrease the amount of tax they pay. This unfortunately made broadsheet papers, newspapers at this point in time, extremely hard to hold. They were British newspapers anyway, were 70 centimetres, over 70 centimetres in length and over six, um, over 60 centimetres in width. Imagine holding that. That's about, that's over two of those 30 centimetre readers you get in school in length. As broadsheets are typically presented in a horizontal folded form, publishers will always make sure that the biggest headline fits into the top half of the front page or is more commonly known as above the fold. However, as you can imagine, with the proliferation of technology and online media, print newspaper profits is in decline, as with advertising revenues. This has led to the vast majority of broadsheets becoming more compact in size. The Guardian actually called their size a Berlinger. It's smaller than a, tab- um, smaller than a broadsheet, but bigger than a tabloid. So this meant that The Guardian went from this, a large broadsheet, to their compact Berlinger size. Even when the Daily Mail was launched in 1896, it was in the size of a broadsheet. It was only in the early 20th century with titles such as the Daily Mirror and the Daily Sketch that the tabloids, half the size of broadsheets, gained a mass, mass readership. The tabloid format was easy to handle and easy to read for people who consumed their news on the move. Gradually, people came round to the tabloid size. The Daily Mail changed shape in 1971 on its 75th anniversary, and the Daily Express followed suit in 1977. It was even later for The Guardian who didn't change their size until 2005. To this day, The Daily Telegraph, The Financial Times and The Sunday Times are the main national papers that are still in the original broadsheet size. So while size used to be a convention of broadsheets, there are now more distinctive elements. Formality, amount of copy, um, the, how much cultural capital you need to understand the, um, the, the headline and the stories. Online, there's still less comment sections, there's less of a desire for videos and so forth. These are the things you would now find in a broadsheet newspaper. So while you may look at these two front pages or two online homepages and consider them to be vastly different because one is tabloid and one is um, broadsheet or perhaps mid-market, 
do remember they do still share conventions of a newspaper for example these two front pages they both have a masthead they both have a headline they both have images they both have a puff and so forth Online, equally, home pages are regularly updated. They do have moving images, advertisements, hyperlinks to other um, social media platforms and so forth. So while yes, broadsheets and tabloids have an array of differences, it's also important to know how they do share some similarities. So let's have a go now at applying our learning to a 15 mark question. The question says, Source A and Source B cover the same news event from two different tabloid newspapers. During the conventions are dynamic, they change over time to stay relevant. How far did your sources demonstrate this? And the sources you can look at for this question is, are these. What you could do now is you can pause and have a go by spending 25 minutes responding to this 15 mark question. Do remember, there is no magic formula to how you write your essays, but I would expect my students to write at least three different paragraphs, each with their own line of argument answering this question with a specific, detailed and comprehensive reference to these sources. So they can pick out different lines of arguments in from these, supporting the question from these sources that's provided by the exam. I would recommend pausing now, having a go at answering this question, and at the end I'm going to show you a student's exemplar. So here's an exemplary response. It received a very high mark, 13 out of 15. As you read it, you perhaps notice the fact that this student has used lots of really good media language. They've been very comprehensive, very detailed in the examples they've given, and they're consistently relating their lines of argument back to the question. So have a go, have, feel free to pause, at, set different elements and take a read. Here is also the examiner's response to this specific question. They praise a lot of it in terms of AO1 and AO2. However, the only thing lettered down was its AO2. The examiner said that it wasn't fully highly developed, it wasn't consistently highly developed in all the parts, it was rather very consistently well-reasoned and accomplished. So, that is it. We have now looked at the history of tabloids, the history of broadsheets, and you've even had the opportunity to apply your learning. As always, if you found this helpful, please do not forget to like, share and subscribe. See you next time.